Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm excited today for a webinar to be exploring the intricacies of blockchain. Uh, we're going to be talking with one of the preeminent leaders in the blockchain world, and it's going to be an exciting uh, hour of content. Now, uh, before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Adeo Resi. I'm CEO of the Founder Institute, and I'm uh, excited to help entrepreneurs all around the world launch their businesses. The Founder Institute has chapters in over 200 cities that help uh, people who have an idea and often a day job to start a company, form a team, build a product, and start to get some customers in early traction. We do that in about three and a half months. We probably have a location in your city. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go to fi.co. If you're interested in applying, you can go to fi.co slash join. And in the off chance we don't have a chapter in your city, you can learn more about opening a chapter at fi.co slash lead. But we're not here to talk about me today. We're here to talk about uh, really a, a, an amazing guy. Uh, a, 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 I would consider a friend, uh, Anthony Diorio. He's one of the founders in many ways of the modern blockchain and crypto movements with his work on Ethereum. Uh, he's gone further now with his new company, Jackson Decentral, and no better person to explain all the things that he's working on than Anthony himself. So let me call Anthony on screen to introduce himself. Anthony, um, tell us a little bit about your background in uh, blockchain and what brings you here today. Anthony, I think your, your mic may be muted. Is that possible? Terribly sorry, how's that? That's way better. All right. I, I love the fish. <laughs> Thank you. I had to get the nice, nicest background I could find. So, so thanks and and thanks for having me here. And uh, it's been great getting to know you over the last number of months and visiting visiting me up here in Toronto and going down and seeing you. So yeah, definitely consider you a friend. And uh, I think it's just great putting something like this together. And I really appreciate it. So my my background in, in the crypto space began in 2012. I was coming off of. Uh, few years of learning about economics and the issues with the, the housing crisis and the financial crisis in the U.S. I'm from Canada. I'm, I live in Toronto, born, born and raised here. And uh, I, I kind of put together a few decades of my life. I, I was born in 75 and I really got into computers very early on in the early 80s. I was building computers when I was like eight years old and, um, and then was on BBS boards uh, in the 80s before the internet. And then when the internet came out, I really understood what was happening there and, and the disruption that, that the, the world of information was, was going to be radically changed by the ability and democratization of information and flow across borders and, and really open up and, and see what would happen there. I went to school for business in Toronto and uh, I've been an entrepreneur since very early on. I worked in the family business from 2000 to 2008, which was sliding patio door manufacturing but always been in the computer space and tech space uh, uh, in my spare time. And, and growing up, I did sports, hockey, baseball, soccer, but computers was really, was really my thing. Uh, in 2012, when I heard about Bitcoin and coming off uh, studying the Austrian School of Economics, kind of the, the alternative economic thinking that, that, is, that is practiced uh, in the world today, the Austrian School really opened my eyes to another way of thinking about money and really learning about about uh, sound money and really what, what money is and how inflation and things that the government do uh, with, with the way the money works right now really leads to a lot of the issues that we have in our world. So when I heard about Bitcoin, I took my tech background, I took the economics, I took my entrepreneurship, and I understood right away that what, we, what we're seeing and what we're going to see is going to be the democratization of value. And it's going to be the ability for people to be in control and be able to to be in control of their lives and become their own banks and not have to rely on a lot of intermediaries and third parties. And so I grasped it right away and I started the Toronto Bitcoin meetup group in 2012, looking for a community of like-minded people. Uh, and then from there, just, just things really, really snowballed and a lot of ideas came at me and I ended up meeting my, uh, the Talib Buterin, the, the, uh, one of my co-founders of Ethereum and the, and the inventor of the idea of Ethereum at my very first meetup, he, he showed up and there was about eight people there. And, this was in 2012, and 
started building wallets in 2013. Then we launched Ethereum and did that whole uh, uh, crowd raise and and launched that. And and since then, I've just been been continuing on to build interfaces and wallets for the whole ecosystem because the wallet I really think is the browser for this technology. It's, a, it's in tune to what the, the browser was for the internet. The wallet is for the blockchain and decentralized tech movement. So what I do is I build interfaces that empower people to be in control of their lives, to uh, to, to learn that it's, it's possible now to own your identity, to own your communications, to own your information, and that, that the technologies behind blockchain and cryptocurrencies enable us to and empower us to be in control of our lives. And that's what I'm doing is trying to build the connections and the interfaces for the everyday people to be able to be in control of their lives. And that that's Jax, right? That the, the parent company. That's Jax. My my company is called Decentral, and our product uh, is called Jax. And Jax is that interface that is is the wallets for eighty five different cryptocurrencies right now. And we've got news wow. in there and portfolios and markets, kind of like the where we want to be the Chrome of the space. We want to be the browser that everything uh, in, in one space, so that my dad has a, a single place to go to to start realizing the power of these new decentralized technologies. So you you um you're doing like a hundred days of jacks right now, right? Which is essentially maybe maybe you could, uh, as part of what you're doing now, tell us what that is because sure. I think it exemplifies a lot of of your philosophy and and approach. Definitely. The the we started off um, when we launched jacks in 2016. The first rendition uh, we did a thing called Seven Days of Jacks, which is basically at every day there's an announcement and. Uh, when you talk about press releases, people say, yeah, you shouldn't do more than one every two weeks or three. I'm like, no, screw that. Let's let's keep pushing new things every day and showing people that we're going to keep. And then, and then when it gets to seven days, we're going to extend it to 14 days. So then we did one that was 30 days, and then we did a 40-day. And now when we launched the new version of Jax called Jax Liberty, which is something that we just put out over, uh, over the last few weeks, and it's been something we've been working on the last three years, it's like, hey, let's do the 100 days of Jax. Let's do 100 days of announcements. So every weekday for the next 100 days, we're either adding a new coin, we're adding a new feature, we're putting out our new desktop versions. It's basically every day. And it's not just that. We're also putting out these really cool animated videos as well every day uh, to kind of showcase our partners, showcase all of the, the different projects that we support because we support the entire ecosystem. We're not here to say we're just about Bitcoin or just about Ethereum. We support 85 different projects, all that are looking to disrupt different sectors that blockchain is going to be able to do. So we're supporting the entire ecosystem, looking to find ways to create wins for everybody. Uh, we have a network of a couple hundred partnerships that are waiting to get integrated in Jack. So it's really bring people together, unite people, and provide the tools to empower people. Well, I want to, before we go on to the main agenda, let me do some housekeeping rules because there's a ton of people uh, chatting right now. It's like speeding by at the bottom. Um, okay, so everyone who's here, we're going to try and get to your questions, and I've seen questions zip by. I have a team that will read your questions, try and pick the ones that we uh, fit in the agenda, slot them in the agenda. So if you have a question, you can demark it as a question or just put question colon, and my team will try to get to it, you know, assuming it fits within the agenda. So again, there's a chat area, click on the chat button, type your question, we'll try and get to it, don't be shy. And I can tell you people are not shy right now, so uh, cool. we'll be all right. Now, I just Andy, want, I just want, to, want to mention sorry, one thing, Adeo, is, is if, if there are people looking to download Jax right now, there's two versions, one Jax Liberty, and that's the one you're gonna to wanna to get right now. That's the newest thing that just came out. So the old one would still show up, but in case you're looking to, to download it, and it's free, uh, no charge, it's free for anybody to use, and uh, Jax Liberty is what you would want to download on the App Store, the iOS Store, um, either way. So I just want to make that clear. So there are hundreds of people here today. My guess is they range from, just given what I know, some people are thinking to go in this space, some people are already in this space, some people who might even be jaded by this space, given some of the questions that I've seen. What I, one thing, though, if they have something that they wanted to do a relationship with Jax, what, what's the process there? And then we'll go into the, the, the agenda. The first topic will be reality versus hype. But how might someone interface with Jax today who has a, an offering? 
Sure. So we've got our users. So we're we're you know we're we're we have also partners. So we have integration partners. So partners that provide services that our users would want to use. So examples is we're, we're we have partnerships with with a number of exchanges. Uh, we've got partnerships with companies like like BitPay that does paying invoices with different cryptocurrencies, Coinbase. So we want to create almost an integration marketplace for all the different services that our users would want to be using. And right now, a lot of, a lot of things are, are on exchanges. So we want to provide a, a, a model to broker different exchanges to provide our, our, the ability for our users to not have to sign into different exchanges on different sites, but basically right inside of Jax, be able to manage and, and, and trade the different cryptocurrencies, but, but not using us, using our third party partners. That way, we're not dealing with a lot of the, the regulatory stuff. We pass it all off to our partners. We don't hold on to customer funds, so it's always held by the user. The keys are held by the end user, not us. There's no database that's storing all the different keys. So think of us as a browser, and integration partners that offer services to our users would be the things that we would be working with in networks of our partners that have um, uh, different products out there that our users would want to use in the cryptocurrency space. And they go to your website and and request to be integrated, essentially, if they, they want it? Yeah, the best place to go would be, to, would be jax.io, uh, jax.io, and then there's a lot of contact information there to get a hold of us. The admin can put that, that put that in there. Okay, let's go to the agenda here. So reality versus hype, there's been a lot of questions. I mean, these questions are speeding by, but, you know, um, what do you think the biggest misconceptions are today uh, relating to blockchain and crypto? And I know there's some, maybe not everyone understands the subtle differences between the two, but what are some of the big misconceptions that you're seeing? I think what we're, it's, it's a very technology focused area. It's very difficult to understand. Uh, there's new term, terms that people have to learn. There's new definitions that have been created over the years that it's, that makes things challenging, but it's, it, what I like to say is that we're moving in from a, an age of information to an age of value and the ability to move value uh, without needing intermediaries or third parties. So when the internet came along, uh, it radically changed everything with information, the ability for the individual to be able to disseminate information globally very fast across borders. Now uh, it's moving into the ability to move value without needing a lot of the intermediaries and third parties that we generally have had to trust in every area of our lives from banks to insurance companies, all these things are, are, gonna, are going to be radically changed and empower the individual to take more control of their lives. And the emergence of Bitcoin really solved the problem uh, in 2009. And before that, everything digital could be copied. And that's really what was a major breakthrough that I've seen, is that before Bitcoin, any, any attempts for a digital currency failed due to the fact that, that you could copy digital things and, and you're losing the, the scarcity and the value and properties of things like money if you can create copies of it. So to have digital assets being able to use for money uh, really wasn't possible before Bitcoin and that was a major problem. And that's opened the doors to a lot of things. The ability to, to have something digital, prove ownership of it, be able to send it from one person to another without needing intermediaries or third parties taking cuts or owning it or having it in a centralized way. And the, the amount of change that's going to create in not just the information uh, the departments and sectors, but in financial institutions and in legal firms and in insurance companies. And it, it really opened the doors to, to financial disruption with the, in the invention of, of Bitcoin. And then when we did Ethereum, it, it, it even um, expanded on that to create something called smart contracts that give the ability to, to have code that executes based on rules and what's been coded to be able to self-execute without needing a lot of the middle layers and a lot of the middlemen and a lot of intermediaries that make things costly, that make things really expensive. So we're gonna see a radical uh, disruption similar to the way that the internet disrupted information. These technologies from, from, from blockchain to smart contracts are going to radically change many, many other sectors that couldn't be done with just the internet alone. So we're starting to see projects emerge that are that are taking their aim at things like the gaming sector, the real estate market, the insurance market, financial services, all using these new technologies that are opening the doors to uh, amazing new creations and things that will be faster, cheaper, better based on technologies that just didn't exist prior to Bitcoin. So I think the biggest misconceptions are that it's going to be something that's going to, going to happen very soon. I think it, it's things that... Um, it's super, it, it's, it's difficult to understand and be able to follow what's going on. I have a difficult time 
So the, the thinking that people can just come in and make a ton of money with it is is something that's uh, that, that generally doesn't happen very easily. Uh, and but make no mistake, it will radically change everything that that you're doing, and it will empower you, and it will lead to things becoming cheaper, better, faster, more choices, empower individuals. Uh, so it, it's going to be the second advent of the of the internet, I believe, and, and more important than the internet. And that's something I kind of recognized very early in 2012. Right, and you were saying that one of the ways that you got into it, because you mentioned earlier that it's confusing, there's all these new terms coming out, so you got into it by starting a meetup, right, mm -hmm. and then essentially learning, and that, that's how you started interfacing with Vitaly and, and other people in the early Ethereum days. You know, for, for people that don't know what they're doing in the space, and there are a lot of people that do, but w would you recommend they go to meetups and start going to events, is that it? Definitely, that, that's, the, that's the main thing you can do. If you feel you have a passion for the space and you're really grasping that, that something, something, something's come, gonna come out of this and, and how you can fit, get your position to be able to, to utilize what's coming and learn about it, it's really getting out to events and, and meeting with like-minded, passionate people in the space. And, and you, you've gotta put your, your time in. You have to really uh, connect, explore, see where, where potentially you're, you're good at and how you can fit into the space there. And it, it takes time. And a lot of people think they're just gonna come in and they're gonna put some money into something that's gonna take off. And well, it just, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, a lot of people thought the same thing when the internet started. And if you're not creating value in the space, if you're not doing something that's really going to create uh, better use cases for people, improve people's lives, you gotta keep working until you can figure out what, uh, what that thing is. And I think really getting to out to conferences, events, and meetups especially. I think meetups are some of the most powerful things in the world. Uh, it's p people beyond their nine to five jobs getting out and, and being passionate and connecting with others. And that's really where ideas flow and, and things connect and, and great ideas uh, start from. And I love that point. So you're basically saying don't just go in it for the quick, quick dollar. Go in it to add value, and that's where it comes. Now, we got a lot of questions I want to ask you one sort of preset question, and and we're gonna I'm gonna try and get through as many as possible. So try and answer as quickly as you can. <laughs> wow! Sure. Um, and I have a list, so we're getting to your questions. But what, what, you know, one of the things we were gonna talk about. So maybe what irks you about the mass media perception of blockchain today? I try not to let things irk me. I don't think there's any sense in really let things bother me. I, I generally don't read the news. Um, being very, very difficult uh, technologies to understand, I think a lot of reporters uh, don't grasp really what's happening. Uh, they tend to uh, look for the, the clickbaity things or things that they, they they want to attach themselves to just because they don't know any better. Um, but I, it doesn't really it doesn't really irk me. I, I think people should uh, get out there and do their own research and really uh, tend to not believe most of what you read is what I've learned. Yeah. And I think um, it, it's 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 figuring out where where you can get the best information, and if you're getting information from close friends that have been in the space for a long time, or again getting up to events, and meetups, and things, um, I would be very cautious with any type of news that I'm that I'm reading, and I, I always take things with a grain of salt. So uh, yeah, I've, I've learned I've learned to disc discount money many things. Yeah, reporters aren't experts, that's for sure. Okay. So asking, uh, it seems cryptos are good at moving value, but what, in your perspective, do you believe the best way to create value and create communities um, in the digital economy that's more than speculation? So, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. The speculation is really not the most interesting part of this. It's we've been now give, been, been given been given a new technology and tools to to be able to build. Um, new business models, be able to look, I think, beyond the way money has generally been created, which is by having third parties providing a service to individuals. Now that you can be more empowered and remove the need for a lot of intermediaries and third parties, I think there's going to be a lot of new ideas and, and things coming out that's well beyond speculation. Speculation is, is it's part of it. Um, if, if, if you're getting into it just for that, uh, you probably won't be around for very long because of the way things go up and down. It's really about saying, how do I improve people's lives? How do I, how do I find something I enjoy doing? And for me, it was, it was finally settling on this, this empowerment and, and recognizing the problems that I'm seeing other companies have with collecting user information and, and not being able to secure stuff and centralized models with something that, I, that I've known for years doesn't work very well. 
So what I'm with my company and the models we figured out is how do we empower people with tools, provide interfaces, connect people, provide partnerships, create wins for everybody, and really really create create value that improves people's lives is what we focus on, and all in a way that is offering free products that doesn't collect user information, doesn't store user funds or have access to user funds, um, doesn't put things in centralized servers. These are all things and principles that we've had that have worked. So um, I think it's about finding your own thing, and it's about saying I'm not going to just get into this and just Look, look to be a speculator because it's really not going to provide much value, and, and I think it's very, it's a very short-lived uh, mentality. So, Anthony, a ton of people are asked for specific examples in industry. I see it's uh, speeding by. So, um, education, retail, construction. You know, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to you to say, like, so you, speculation isn't a great business model. You brought up now things like insurance and some clear fintech examples in your speaking. You know, any other like education, re, any other examples that might be of interest to the audience? Because people are asking for specifics left and right. Sure. So I think there's a number of different examples. Uh, there's the the gaming space, I think, is is really ramping up and the ability for people to own a digital asset that's that's unique and can't be duplicated and you can own a, a sword that is only one in existence and uh, things like that are really picking up in the gaming space right now. Uh, real estate, being able to own a piece of a property, uh, so tokenizing real estate and being able to say that I can't afford to buy a, a house in, in, in the major city, but I can afford to buy a piece of a house. Uh, so that's in the real estate space. Maybe, being able to have more efficiencies in insurance with smart contracts whereby policyholders can be paid instantly based on a contract of, of weather uh, conditions that happen automatically without needing a lot of middle areas and, and intermediaries or, or adjusters in between. Um, uh, other things where developers are creating contracts that, that would self-execute based on, uh, let's say, wills or you have a certain will laid out and according to uh, data coming in that you passed away, your, your digital assets will be automatically dispersed uh, to different uh, parties that you've set up in your contract to do without needing uh, lawyers, costly lawyers, or the time that delays and things like that. Um, a number of different things. There's, 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 and, and a lot of the things are, are, are not even sorted out yet and will yeah. be figured out just like the internet. There's no way we were thinking the, the radical change in social media back in the, in the early 90s, let's say. But then we've seen what, what's happened with the tools of the internet and what companies uh, have been able to, to achieve through through just the things that they didn't know back then that, that emerged and ideas came out. And that's where we are. We're at the very early stages where the, yeah. the, the interfaces are being built out, the infrastructure is being built out. And once that's in place and the everyday people are, are utilizing the technology without even knowing what they're really doing, they're going to start seeing the advantages that are going to be emerging. The way you're talking, you know, it seems like you're saying that at some point in the not too distant future, you believe that almost all of the things that you hold in paper today or you have some sort of asset uh, uh, ledger for maybe an email receipt or something like that will be moved to the blockchain. So as you brought up, you know, pretty much your will, <laughs> your, your home, your car, you know, so pretty much everything's going to have a blockchain record and, and be transferable. Yeah. Well, isn't it making sense though? Doesn't it make sense that everything's turning digital? We saw the digitization of information, yeah. you know, the digitization of value, and the digitization of assets. That's and the email is a terrible storage mechanism for your receipts, right? So yeah, and and and, and again, it's it's about the ability to have something digital that can't be duplicated. That's the big thing. If I have a deed to a property, and there's you can make a copy of that deed and give it to someone else, it doesn't make any sense. But if I can prove that that that, that deed is mine, I own it. And it can't be duplicated, and I have the keys, the digital keys via cryptography to say that I own this, and I can send it to someone else, but now they have it, and I don't have it anymore. It really does open the door to things that couldn't possibly be done before, and that's it's all about digitization and, and moving and using decentralized technologies and, and just a, an ongoing uh, uh, continuation of the movement to digitize everything. Well, I want to. We'll come back to that, but we have a lot of regulatory questions that are coming mm -hmm. in as well. I mean, we can just go on and on. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Great, great, great work, guys. We're going to get to your questions. So, on the regulatory front, uh, let's go through some of them. Jenny was asking, "Do you see new regulations on the horizon to tax tokens uh, for use cases where tokens are earned, used, or exchanged with members, but not redeemed for fiat currency?" So, essentially. 
total virtual taxation? Yeah, I, I think right now what we're seeing is governments trying to understand what's happening here. They're trying to understand these are these, these are things that, that have never been made to fit into the general regulatory environments that they created. So, and the technologies are moving so quickly that the regulatory bodies are really having a hard time even defining what these things are. So, for example, when, when Bitcoin came out, a lot of the regulations here in Canada were mentioning Bitcoin. But they didn't, you know, they, they would call it a digital currency, but they didn't define what a digital currency is. And then Ether came out with Ethereum, and it's not really a digital currency. It's more of a fuel that it's very, it's, it's moving, it's fluid, and it changes so radically. I think the old models aren't really going to work in the way the governments try to regulate these things. Um, people are, are doing things more anonymously. They want to do things more privately. And I don't see how the government's going to keep up with the regulatory models that they have in place. And I think it requires a new framework or a new way of thinking about it. But until then, they're going to try to tax it the way they, they, they've always had and look for opportunities to make even more money based on these. But it's going to be super challenging because, I mean, to even tax things like cash is super difficult. And to be able to do this in a way that they don't even know who's moving what makes it very difficult. So they will try to do it. I'm not sure they're going to be able to. Well, and then um, they are trying to block it. So Expedito um, was asking, how do you think systems will try and block uh, with laws the evolution of blockchain? So I, they can try to block it. I, I don't know how, like you can't stop someone from sending a Bitcoin transaction. It's virtually impossible. So I don't know how they're gonna try and block these technologies. Uh, and and if there is a weak point of them, of, of them being able to do something. Innovation is coming that, that, that is always one step ahead. So there's coins that are focused just on privacy and creating better privacy because a lot of these ledgers are more are transparent. They're visible like Bitcoin and Ethereum. You can see uh, transactions that happen. You don't know necessarily who's behind them. But then there's projects like Monero. There's projects uh, like Zcash that are coming out to, 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 to solve that problem as they see it of even creating better privacy that tracking it's going to be virtually impossible. So I, I don't know how that the blocking would be, would be done. Yeah, I mean, China banned it, right? Uh, but it doesn't seem to have stopped Chinese from participating, though Chinese people are generally afraid of what the government regulates. I mean, did you do you see that? Like just government saying, hey, don't do it and people will listen or you think it will be uh, largely ignored? I think on a, mm -hmm. on a if these, these if these governments were independent and they didn't have work in a global system, a global economy where other countries will embrace and will will look to empower their their citizens or say how do we take advantage of these and, and utilize it in a beneficial way for our, our you know creating new sectors, new jobs, new things. Why don't why don't we embrace instead of maybe trying to to be in a fear state or try to control? And places like China that are trying to control, I just think at the end of the day, fear and control doesn't win out. And I think freedom liberty, uh, uh, choice are all the things that are going to eventually win out down the road. So I'm not, I, I think they're hurting themselves more than they are helping themselves. And I think over time, the ones that do embrace, recognize that there is opportunities here, are, will be the ones that are eventually going to become uh, global leaders in, in, in these technologies. Right. And so governments um, should probably, I, I completely agree. I think the governments that are trying to overregulate right now are putting themselves in a long-term disadvantage. I think they should be, I think that the best thing to do is educate themselves. And I'm always willing to work with, with government entities and bodies to say, hey, if they want to learn, they want to understand what's really happening here, uh, it can be beneficial. So they, a lot of times they tend to go to the fear side. It's like, no, this is opportunity here, just like the internet. This is an amazing opportunity here and better see what potential we have. I, I don't like the word we, but the potential potentially that that country has to to provide better things and, and utilize these technologies to 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 help and to empower people. So um, another question from I'm gonna hopefully I get your name name right. Yev Yev Henny is uh, talking about regulations. How far do you think privacy can go? Right? Will it be possible to have totally fungible coins? Like, is it? Um, yeah, I mean the fun. Well. Yes, in that sense, how far will privacy go? Well, I think mm -hmm. over time, uh, again, it's, to me, I look at everything from the lens of freedom. And I think uh, privacy to me is a right. Uh, at the end of the day, though, some, some system happens or something, uh, fear is also very powerful. And governments uh, can react a lot of times to, to fear. So I think what needs to happen is a tipping point where privacy becomes more important 
And we're seeing a movement happening now where people are trying to, or to understand more about uh, you know, how it's detrimental to, to give out your information and it's very difficult to secure information. And we're seeing major companies now that are dealing with the backlash of, of the models that they're using to monetize and to monetize their users. And I think it, the, it's, it's growing the, the feeling that, wait a sec, I should be in more control. I should be able to be in control of my information. I should be able to be in control of my money. And I think the, the, the tipping point happening on that where people realize that's more important than what could potentially happen on the fear side is something that I hope happens first before any other major events or something that happens where the tipping point hasn't occurred yet. So I'm always hopeful that we'll get to that point first before something happens that could radically slow things down. Right. Well, I mean, look, privacy doesn't feel like a right today. Right. And, and I would say, and I'm interested, I mean, it seems like most of the people that I know that are heavily involved in the crypto world uh, take the concept of privacy as a right very seriously. Is that almost like an ent entry stakes to, to being in the blockchain and crypto world to take privacy very seriously? Or is it kind of you could or could not. I'm interested in your views on that. So for me, uh, I believe that the, the most important thing is the individual. I'm not a fan of groups. I'm not a fan of bucketing people together into a thing and saying, hey, there's a we or that's us and we all stand for this. I, I'm just not a fan of that. I think the individual uh, and uniqueness of individuals is the most important thing. So I really don't uh, like when people are bucketed into groups. And it's more to me a, a freedom and, and uh, mentality of is what I'm doing here or what we're doing provide more freedom and liberty to me. And to me, privacy is just part of that. And I, and I think and believe that I should be able to have the right to privacy. Uh, but I'm also a, a diplomatic person that sees things on the other side and says, I can understand where uh, there's going to be the, the double-edged sword as well of the other side of things that say, well, you know, should you have a right to privacy if you're doing X? And I don't think I have a lot of answers to some to these things. And a lot of people do get into the space because of the freedom movement or the libertarian movement. And that includes a lot about privacy and being in control of your lives and not saying I'm going to be part of a, of a you know a cog in the wheel here where where I'm going to be told what to do. And, and I think it, the mentality of individualism and saying I'm an individual, I'm going to do great things. I I don't want to be put in this bucket of saying I'm, I'm a group of people is a, is a powerful thing and. It does stem, I think, from, from privacy thinking and, and uh, freedom thinking. So Ye Yehuda was asking a question. So we talked about a lot of things uh, that might move to blockchain. Yehuda was asking, what are the limitations of blockchain and maybe examples of any businesses that you don't think would be good to be brought into the world? Sure. So I think limitations right now, it, the biggest thing is scalability. It's these decentralized systems have a limitation uh, and need information to go around the globe very fast. And the infrastructure is not quite there yet that enables a lot of these systems to be scalable to, to, for the whole world to use. And that's a limitation right now which has uh, impacted the ability for these technologies to make things faster, cheaper, better at this time. Once those problems are solved, I firmly believe you're going to see the, a massive changes happening in, in the different sectors that I, that I mentioned. So right now, you almost consider these things as beta, that there's problems that need to be solved still that enable that would enable um, growth and enable scaling of the technologies. Uh, and this is what's being solved now. And I'm confident it will be solved over the next couple of years. And we see a number of projects emerging that are looking to, to, to work on scalability problems from RSK to EOS to Dash. There's a number of projects that are saying, hey, there's a problem here. Let's try and fix that. So limitations are right now with the infrastructure and scaling. Uh, in terms of businesses that would be quite useful in this, I think I think there's going to create change in pretty much every business out there. We'll have some impact in these technologies. I'd like to say that information was for the internet. Now everything else that wasn't changed by information is going to be radically changed through not just blockchain, but let's say uh, um, with, with, with uh, cryptography, with smart contracts, with a number of new thing, things that are coming out that aren't just about blockchain necessarily, but new technologies that are emerging. Right. So even a corner bakery might accept uh, a payment with a digital currency. So you could argue that it touches a corner bakery. Yeah. I mean, instead of using, uh, maybe they're, 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 they have their own coin or a loyalty system, or maybe they're using Bitcoin to accept payments or another one of the technologies and bypassing 
uh, payments to to uh, payment processors or not accepting. It. So yeah, I think there's I going to be. I bought a Starbucks coffee with Litecoin the other day, courtesy of the gentleman you and I both know. So I was like, you know, there you go. Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, okay, so lots of questions. Um, oh, wow, so many. So a bunch of people were asking, you know, like I'm a UX designer or I, I have some blockchain. What? So Cecile was asking, as a UX designer, um, how blockchain projects would be effective on the UX process, how these projects affects habits and uh, with digital products. Um, so a lot of people are saying like with their expertise, you know, what might happen. So, so I, as a UX designer or designer, what might some blockchain opportunities be in your mind? I think there's huge opportunities because it's, it's the interfaces and, and the designs that haven't been fully baked out yet with these technologies. It's, it, yeah. it, creating something like a wallet like we do, it's to me it's all about the user experience and it's about the design because it's it's a super complicated system and you've got things like mining fees that need to be taken into account for in the user design. You've got key systems which you have to explain to people. It's so being able to break things down into an interface that is easy to use is something that, that um, comes down the road from the initial stages. So when new technologies emerge, you have the hardcore technology people building things and they're not usually focused on interfaces and design. They're focused on, on, the, on the technologies and, and the protocols. So what we're seeing now is, is uh, companies distinguishing themselves by the UX designs and by the interfaces that, that they're creating. So I think there's tons of opportunity for great UI and UX designers in this space to solve problems, to bring the masses into the technologies, uh, making it simplified. Because a lot of it's still very technical. And speaking of which, Stephen was asking, I work for a moderately sized software development company in Philly and we have blockchain development capabilities, what do you see as the best path for a business like ours to leverage the blockchain? So when we say, when I hear like blockchain capabilities, it's, it's what, well, what level of blockchain capabilities is that? What, what does that necessarily mean? How long have you been around in the space? How are you understanding how protocol design is? Is it more being able to work with other people's stuff? There's a lot of questions I would have from something like that. Uh, I get a lot of people reaching out saying, you know, we've got a lot of developers in blockchain. Well, I'd have to dig in a lot more about what that exactly means. Uh, if you have the skills and you have the team that has been in the space for a number of years and understands how many different protocols work, there's tons of business out there uh, to be working with 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 um, uh, many different types of businesses that are looking to, to, to put their foot into the space. Um, but I would need a little more information about what, what skills they actually have in blockchain to be able to to see if, if, if what they're doing it could have value because you have some guys that are saying well we do websites for blockchain companies well that's really not blockchain stuff and a lot of people try to use the word blockchain to to entice new business and opportunities really when they don't have the the skills needed to really create uh, game changing things so really what you would maybe the answer is uh, to assess your competency level relative to can you work on protocol level stuff interface level stuff, marketing stuff, and, and sort of bucket yourself first. And then, you know, because you're right, like, that's that's a terrible assessment. I can do blockchain. It's like, okay, yeah. like, what in blockchain? <laughs> you know, like, that's a, that's a that, big that's, term. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so then uh, Michael was asking, if you're a traditional established companies, do you see investing intelligently in blockchain uh, technologies as as a smart move, and maybe uh, to further Michael's question, what what, what might a established company do so they don't fall behind the ball? Yeah, uh, so in, in 2015, uh, it's when really we saw the advent of, of large companies starting to, to investigate blockchain. Nasdaq kind of made the first moves um, and said, well, "Hey, we're investigating these technologies, and we're going to start putting some teams together to start seeing if there's." use cases for us there, and that really started an avalanche of other large companies getting in. Uh, I started consulting in 2015 due to the amount of, of um, the, the amount of, of companies, the amount of enterprise uh, banks and things that were starting to look at the technologies, and I started consulting for banks and started consulting for companies like Deloitte and, and the Toronto Stock Exchange. And so I think the most important thing when you're a, a traditional system or a large enterprise a company is to um, find someone that's been in the space a number of years that can really take you down a path where you're not 
spinning your wheels or doing things that aren't going to benefit you because there, there is a learning curve and the faster you can ex expedite your knowledge of the space, uh, the more you're going to be able to keep up with it and really be able to see uh, uh, what things you can you can achieve and what you can achieve. So I saw a lot of companies carry out uh, a lot of a lot of projects that that really didn't go anywhere. And I think a lot of to do is they didn't have the expertise and guidance of people that have been around for a long time to help guide them through that. A lot of the top people in the space aren't too keen to work with older with the more traditional uh, companies because they're I disrupting am. them, right? Well, yeah, I, I think I think they yeah they, they're focused on their own things and it's exciting what they do. And you'd have a very rare case where you have someone that would want to work for one of these guys and help them along. Uh, I'm a little bit different. I, I I did work for them and I felt that if people want to 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 see how they can still provide value and move from a traditional business into more of a, a leader startup mentality, then I'm all for helping them do that. I was the chief digital officer of the Toronto Stock Exchange on a part-time basis for a number of months, helping and guiding them through uh, while I was still focused on my, my business. So I'm, I'm for creating wins and, and bringing along people that want to learn. So I think the most important thing is education uh, and trying to see how you can, you can do that at a faster basis and see what projects might emerge and what ideas that might come up. And again, it's also getting out to the meetups, getting out to events, getting your staffs out to this stuff because you're already at a disadvantage being such a large entity trying to create change internally that's super hard to change. But if you don't, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, I believe, down the road. So that's an, an opposite to the way they normally work because they normally are like, we're going to do this. And they're like, have a project. We'll release a new brand, buy or whatever. And you're saying, no, don't, don't jump head first in. You know, start learning learning, start discovering, and then, and then, and then go from there. You know, yeah. just as out of curiosity, what do you think, is there any hope, and this relates to another question from Jay, which I'll get to in, in a second, but is there any hope that, uh, that these big companies might buy a, a, a blockchain or crypto uh, and, and have a success? Or do you think the, it's like oil and water and you're never going to get a... No, I, I, I think what these, what these uh, entities have is they have capital. I think what they're lacking is probably the the skilled developers and teams that have been in the blockchain space for a while. And what I've seen is a lot of hires or a lot of teams that form inside of the large entities have trouble holding on to their teams and they leave for more uh, startup focused projects. And it's a, it's a big challenge and I've seen it with a number of large, large computer companies, um, banks, where they just can't hold on to their staff because they're so enticed to, to work in a, in a more fast paced environment and this blockchain is like the their, their way of saying this, this is the last straw. This is so much exciting going on here. I can't work for something that's moving so slow. So I think they're going to face some, some really difficult challenges. And it, it's uh, being able to purchase companies, I think it would make sense. But you may lose the teams coming in if you're not uh, adapting to the way that they want to operate and work. But I think a lot of companies uh, could be uh, targets for, for enterprise uh, and financial services and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. It would, I think it might help legitimize the space, which leads to a question coming up uh, again from Yevgeny, which I hope I pronounce your name right. But Jay's question was, in the blockchain world, is there room for intermediaries to profit? Um, if not, do we see investment? Because it's, it's almost ironic, right, that uh, in the traditional tech space, people are like, I'm disintermediable. By becoming an intermediary and <laughs> re intermediate you know, it's like everyone who's disintermediating people is re intermediating them. Where, where is, I, yeah. I think it's a slow process. I think you can't go from A to Z very fast. I think you need to gradually uh, work with the models that exist today, which are uh, the third party models of providing a service. But what I think happens over time is that uh, you, you get more intermediaries, but things be, uh, get to, down to a race towards zero. What I mean by that is, is uh, as things become more and more um, done by technology and replacing a lot of the human factor with things, you're going to start to see a reduction in costs over time. And eventually the models of making money are going to disintegrate down to zero. I really think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be more pure connected things, individual to individual. And you'll be, you'll be monetizing still based on the way that you're able to have a platform that brings it over, but your costs will be reduced. And eventually you're going to have razor thin margins where people are going to need to think outside the box of how they're going to make money or how they're going to still provide value. And an example I saw with those in the, in the gambling space, in, in cryptocurrencies and start, which 
you know, I, I dabbled in in 2012 and saw that, that now within the gaming space, you could prove that the house isn't cheating the player. And once you can prove that and you know what the house edge is, you have competitors making a better house edge. So if it's going like, let's say, let's say three spins out of 100, you get a 3% house edge. Well, the next guy is going to come in with a product of 2.9. The next guy is going to come in with 2.5. Then it's going to get to, and it literally gets down to zero. And you start having to think, well, if the ways of making money have always been based on, on this spread here, and there's no margins now, well, how do I make money and how do I provide value? And that's where you start thinking outside the box. Wow. So I think the way of making money is going to, going to, going to get down to the point where the intermediaries are no longer there. There's no money to be made in that space, but there'll be a lot of choice and value and cheaper for the user. But how else can I compete and what value can I create outside of making money? And that's where we got to really think differently. That's that's one of the best. I just want everyone to let that sink in for a moment. Imagine a gambling establishment where the house has no edge. And then what models emerge for value creation? That's fascinating. I mean, frankly, just holding the money in an arbit, you know, and 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 like a bank, right? And then well, I've got an I I I've, I've got like I I got to the point of trying to solve in that. So you, you have, <laughs> you could have an insurance model where every time you, you play, you have to put in a type of insurance and basically there's a way for you to, to, to if you lose a lot, you're going to be collecting money on the insurance, but the insurance could be a token that, that you need to play. So the token, when you, when you put a bet, you're also putting in a value of insurance on a token. So a token also has to be included with every bet. So as you're losing, you're getting this token still. And the token has value, and the house will buy it back at a discounted rate because you still need the token in order to play. So there's things that you start thinking about beyond wow. the spread of, of, of providing an, uh, a fee for charging for a service. So it's when you don't start thinking outside the box, I found, or start thinking, this is where it's heading. Well, if that's heading that way, we need to start thinking differently because maybe the way that we make money these days and, and, and providing a trust element for individuals is wrong or it's not going to be around and, and how do we still create value and still live? And that's where I think the, the wow, thing is. Wow, like, you might have just destroyed the casino industry with like an alternative gambling model where the house has no edge. You know, Vegas, Macau, goodbye. Um, you, Yevgeny's question, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, when do you think this early adoption stage will end where, you know, kind of all these things we're talking about are classic early adoption stuff? Is it in the short term or how, how many years do we have left in this love? There's a number of factors which could derail things. I talked about the fear uh, yeah. thing of governments and could there be some type of terrorist activity that happens when uh, potentially Bitcoin is used for transactions, something like this that could happen that could derail at least the speed of it happening, but it's going to happen. It's, it's, there's, these technologies can't be put back in the bag. They will radically change everything. So I don't know when it's going to happen. I think the, the user experiences have to get better. I think yeah. the scalability problems need to be solved. Uh, I think the, 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 the movement we're seeing with people questioning why their private information could potentially be leaked and how they're not in control of that information and questioning the business models of companies that collect user information and sell it and expect that information not to be, uh, not to get out there and to be compromised. I think that's just a, a failed model that's, that's never worked that well, but it's what those companies know and they haven't necessarily been forced yet to think of other ways to create value but we're starting to see uh, the heat coming on a lot of these companies. So I so think it's happening, are, right? Yeah, it's, it's happening. happening. Yeah. But it's not days or months. It's the things no. you talk about, like infrastructure, speed, uh, collapse of sort of centralized models. This is probably measured in, in, in years, yeah. but not, not many years, but. Well, look, look at where we got, how long it's taken to get to where the internet is to where we are today. I mean, the early 90s when it started, it takes time. Uh, and we're we're at the equivalent very early on stages, I still believe. Okay, well, let me, but but things are speeding up. And asked a question about existential risks. I move, I, we have an ordering of questions here, so I'm moving them around, uh, which was, what will happen when quantum computers are able to decrypt our and calculate the keys? Um, I, I think we'd have more problems to work on. Uh, if that was the case, because that would also radically impact every other financial system that also works on very similar uh, key-based systems. 
So I think it's it's going beyond what's going to happen with with Bitcoin if that were to happen. Uh, right. But I also believe there's Every technologies thought. that are that are working on quantum resistance systems, and I think there's uh, there's people that say that might be a problem, and, and they're working to try to fix that. Um, okay, and and then Carlos was asking, so I'm just get, trying to get as many of these in as possible, uh, and, and agreed that like they're bigger problems if all the keys are decrypted. Uh, Carlos is asking, can blockchain be the backbone of the future digital idea, and what are your thoughts of that? Digital ID, definitely. I mean, your keys that you have uh, and the ability for you to own those keys, no one else has them, there's no server storing them, could be your identity keys. It could be your your, your money, your keys for all your, your assets. It could be the keys for your communications. So, yes, uh, these, these technologies, I think, will uh, enable people to be their own banks, own their own identities, and own their own communications. And that's what we do with JAX. Is with JAX, you get your keys and... Uh, those keys and the ability to sign something with those keys that only you have proves who you are. So there's a lot of companies focused on identity systems right now. And, and yeah, it is, I believe, the future of, of, of being able to prove your identity without necessarily needing to expose other personal information. Isn't that also a vulnerability, though? Uh, and it... Yes and no. I, I think that with these decentralized open systems, the amount of technology and innovation is going to emerge to still enable people to be in full control, but be able to offer services that help further secure things like your money, things like your identity and your communication. So there's things like multi-sig systems where you could own, a, you could have a two out of three of the keys. Now, if you lose one, there could be a third party that owns, has one key or one part of your key. He can't do anything with that one key himself, but a combination right. of him plus your other key enables you to still be in control to get your second key. So there's there's innovations and there's there's problems that will be solved to give more choice. And because these systems are are um, open and anybody can build on them, this innovation will happen rather than more of the controlled systems that we see either with government identity systems or financial services. Well, in theory, you know, biomarkers could be used as keys to that yeah. end, right? Um, okay, there's a lot. Wow, a lot of good questions here. So I'm like, I'm trying to order them, but they're all really good. So uh, Huntington was asking, you know, and, and again, these are going to be a little random because we're running out of time. What would a company, why would a company spend the time and money to move away from functioning legacy systems that have proven and effective results to one built on blockchain? So uh, I think that each company would have to make their own investigations. I think not at least learning and trying to, to, to get ahead of where things might be in the future would probably be a mistake. I think that uh, when we see hacks happening on centralized systems and we see companies not being able to, to stop uh, attacks on their data because centralized systems have weaknesses, I think we'll start investigating uh, you know, ways to avoid, hmm, we could be, we could be fined heavily if our, this information gets out, this information is on centralized servers. And, Maybe a decentralized approach could be better, whereby uh, we're not going to be fined a lot, or we don't have to be at risk of trying to protect something that people want. And instead, we can create a system where you're you're incentivized to it would cost you know you're incentivized to not just um, secure it, but you're incentivized uh, to make it in a way that 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 there's no central attack vector point. So a lot of the systems right now are centralized. Yes, they work very well, but with decentralized systems, and I think mostly attack vectors, I think that in the future, you will get efficiencies from these technologies that you can't have right now, and you'll, it'll see a reduction of, of the workforce. You're going to start seeing a technology making things cheaper for your customers, and you're going to have to get on board with these things. Uh, if not, uh, you're, you're going to be um, at a disadvantage. And disrupted, yeah. right? Perul was another good one here. Uh, they get better. Uh, some of them are a little dark, but Perul was asking, how do you see venture capital being impacted uh, by blockchain? What parameters would they need to consider for um, evaluating or, or investing in a blockchain startup? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know, like, yeah, I'll, I'll let you take that one. I have some sure. thoughts. So <laughs> You're the guest. <laughs> we're seeing the democratization of venture capital. We're seeing the average everyday person being able to um, yeah. 
to put something into these ICOs or put something into a project, crowdsourcing projects. And I think we saw the democratization of information, now it's the democratization of venture capital. When we, when we started Ethereum, uh, we were able to, to collect $18 million from 9,000 participants all around the world who funded the, 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 the launch of Ethereum, which we did a year later, and they were able to have a piece of that. So it's something that you wouldn't traditionally be able to see. So it democratized the, the amount of, uh, the, the ability for the everyday person to be able to, to say, I, I believe in this and I'm going to take the risk and I'm going to be able to potentially get the gains from this. So I think it's gonna radically change. And we're seeing a num number of VCs getting into token sales. And so it's gonna, it's gonna create a radical change, I believe. So, I mean, in, in many ways, you know, venture capitals uh, being uh, disrupted. So <clears throat> thinking of the role of the venture capital and taking the fees and everything like that, it's it's inverting the model because it's letting mm -hmm. the, the sort of quote unquote LPs run the shop. Um, a little dark here. Gabriella was asking, if I die, what happens to my cryptocurrency? Well, it depends. If you set things up that uh, potentially you've got a loved one that you can also give a set of the keys to or, or write down your, your, your keys and have it in a safety deposit box. And then maybe your executor of your will uh, would have access to the box and you could set it up like that. So it's about how you prepare and how you plan for it. And it's, it would be up to you to ensure that uh, someone that you would love have, would have access should something happen to yourself. Is that the best practice though? Like put it in a safety deposit box and uh, give People that have different, different ways. People, some people say they don't trust the banks. Uh, uh, put it somewhere safe. Put it somewhere safe. Potentially give a copy of your keys to someone that you tr that you really trust, uh, and maybe that's the way to do it. Uh, you have to trust. I would say you'd have to trust somebody in that aspect. Uh, with it, you could also make potentially have a smart contract that's moving the funds automatically to a loved one once. Uh, yeah, but then it's who executes that. So the best thing I think right now would be able to write down your twelve words or write down your your keys and have it somewhere that, uh, or give it to someone else that you would trust, but you would then need that, that trust element. Right, but a lot of the whole blockchain world and crypto world is based on trust, right? At the end of the day. A lot of it's still trusting mathematics and not necessarily trusting individuals. So, <laughs> example with the gambling thing, the, the reason why uh, provably fair gaming came about and the ability to prove the house isn't cheating is because there was a recognition that you don't know what the house is doing. You don't know if they're cheating. So to come, it, it said that's not good enough for the blockchain space, for the cryptocurrency. We need things that are provable. We need things that we don't have to trust individuals. We want to trust math. We want to trust technology instead. So yes, there's an element of trust. You're trusting code. You're trusting the ability to see what the code does and you're trusting what other people believe in and have trust in it rather than the whims of individuals. It's really what that, that movement's about. Wow. So there's, so I, I, I want to let you go where you want to go here. We got all different kinds of questions about businesses or tech stuff. Do you have a preference? On which no, I just keep, keep firing away. Happy to get all right, I'll keep firing away. Yeah. Um, I, I find this one interesting. You know, what are the challenges and opportunities for blockchain in developing countries at the moment? Because I know with hundreds of people online, they're coming from all around the world. What are your thoughts there? There's, there's like billions of people that don't have access to the financial services that we take for granted every yeah. day. And I think the ability for, for developing countries to recognize they have an opportunity to bypass a lot of traditional legacy systems and go directly into these new technologies without having to worry about um, the, the fight or pushback from a lot of the, the uh, incumbents. So like was done with mobile phones and the bypassing of landlines in a lot of Africa and other areas, I think the ability now to to go straight into these new systems uh, without the fight of, of powerful entities that uh, don't exist in the financial services because they're just not offered right now in a lot of developing countries. So I think they have the ability to understand, educate, and then create new systems without dealing with a lot of the, the backlash that might be happening from, from, from the, uh, the incumbents. Right, so that's called leapfrogging, right? Where they could have installed landlines, but instead they did mobile. Exactly. Uh, so uh, here's a pretty technical question from Nick, which is the rub on blockchain is the amount of time it may take to validate the block for systems that have a time critical element. What is your vision on improving performance for block validation? We've seen a lot of improvements. We've seen Bitcoin that, that, that takes, you know, it's uh, 10 minutes there uh, roughly. 
Uh, and then we've seen things like Ethereum that every 15 seconds you're getting a value. So over the years, the technologies have improved and generally we're, we're, we're getting much shorter times and, and those problems are being solved by a number of different projects. So you, you see innovation happening there. Um, and then, you know, obviously uh, a kind of a basic question from Cynthia, which is what are some of the resources that you recommend to start learning about blockchain? So you, earlier we had discussed going to meetups, going to events. We have a Founder Institute chapter starting in Toronto uh, with a blockchain track. What are some other things you would say to read or? There's a couple good books that I recommend. Um, there's a Blockchain Revolution, uh, the Business Blockchain. Uh, those are good starting points, uh, I think, for the for the the average person to to want to grasp in a non-technical fashion. For those that are a little more advanced, maybe there's Mastering Bitcoin, Mastering Ethereum that it, that Andreas uh, Tanopoulos has put out. Um, there, there's not a plethora of good holistic resources for the entire space. A lot of focus on specific individual projects, and you'll see a lot of stuff on Bitcoin. I do think getting out to events and really connecting with individuals and really it, it's probably the best way to, to do it. You have the, the organizers of meetups that are, are generally great resources if you have one in your area. Uh, and getting out there and really just 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 connecting with, with and networking with people, I find the best way. And I love your earlier point, like don't come in it with this speculative mindset per se, come in it with a sense of how you can add value, which I thought was a great insight earlier. Um, we'll get through a couple more questions here. Uh, uh, Xanthi was at, oh, again, I hope I pronounced your name right, what the impact uh, of blockchain will be to the 1%, 99% wealth divide, will it have any impact? And if so, how might that be? Uh, positive. I'll go back again to the empowerment and being able to empower and provide things to individuals uh, no matter where you are. Uh, there's no permission systems in the things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Anybody can participate. You don't have to be onboarded. You don't need to have something in your local area that you need to register to do. You basically are, are saying it's, it's their permissionless system that anybody can, can, can take and participate in. And I think that's super important for a lot of the 90, the 99 percent that don't have access to these things. And I think it's going to force maybe a lot of the one percenters who aren't creating a lot of value uh, and are, aren't, aren't recognizing that these technologies will radically change the businesses that they're in. So they've got opportunities to adjust. But at the end of the day, I think it's a very democratizing, powerful technologies that will lead to more empowerment and more individual uh, rights and freedoms. And uh, before the last question, Pete was saying like, so if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm looking for opportunities, right, for blockchain uh, disruption, what might I do? And, and talked about one of the reasons we did this Founder Institute track in Toronto was because entrepreneurs often pick kind of dumb things to do first in the blockchain space. So what, what might be some guidance for someone like Pete to not do those dumb yeah, things? Yeah, it's, it's really, a, there's a learning curve and the faster you can, ex, you can expedite that learning curve and recognize why maybe doing an ATM business, a Bitcoin ATM, it doesn't make sense or why people have tried these things and they haven't worked or uh, why the low hanging fruit of maybe getting merchants to start accepting Bitcoin, which a lot of people do off the bat, it doesn't make any sense because it's difficult to set up equipment inside. There's, there's a lot of these things which you can expedite and, and uh, and, and not waste time doing that others have done. So this is where it's important, I think, getting out to events and seeing what others have done and just, just immersing yourself in these and, and teaming up with people or being able to connect with people that have been there for years. I've been in this space six years and I, and I can pretty easily identify what what's works, what doesn't work, why they don't work. And I've seen pretty much everything that's, that's happened in the space of, and, and if you could help an, a new person get through that hurdle and get to a point where they can create true value in what they're planning to do, I think is, is something to shoot for. So, I, you know, candidly, I came in pretty bullish on blockchain already because I've, for a variety of reasons. And I, I'm leaving the talk today more bullish uh, than before. So I think that's good. And, and I, a couple things, your casino analogy really blew my mind of like the house has no vague. I was like, whoa, that's interesting. But also when I saw all the different things, you're right that all these digital assets are going to be moving uh, to, to decentralized formats. That, that's also a no brainer because it's stupid to keep receiving 
sheets and dollar receipts in a file cabinet, right? That's that's also vulnerable and dumb. But you know, so I'm coming out pretty enthused. So any final closing tips for aspiring entrepreneurs or others to take advantage of this upcoming decentralization that's happening? Again, I, I think I pretty much covered the, the what, what you should do if you're really into the space, you're passionate about it, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and effort and you got a lot of learning to do. So think about what you can utilize of your own skills and how they might translate to this new technology. If you're really good at math, you're really good at finance, look for ways there that you can take those skills and translate it into a, an, an interest into um, how they will impact blockchain and, and see what other people are doing in that space. So I think it's about translating what you're good at and trying to find a way that you can create value in doing something that's going to improve people's lives. And 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 can I just take that and clarify one thing there? So a lot of these companies working in blockchain today have essentially decentralized teams. So it might be a, one way after you go out to the events, et cetera, is raise your hand and say, can I help somehow to an up and coming startup and and participate? I mean, w would you recommend that yeah, as a possible if, step? If you're at an event and you've got <laughs> something you're connecting with other people, you're gonna find someone with a good idea and you're gonna say, hey, well, I've got the opportunity, I can do this. And it's about then, then you're forming teams and you're moving forward with an idea. So, yeah, uh, as much you can do to network, as much as you can do to, to come forward and, and connect with people. That's that's how I did it. I mean, when I uh, my my initial partner when I started uh, building wallets back in the day, it was basically came in through Reddit, and he had, he was a developer that, that that really appreciated the space, and he was looking for someone with business ideas, and that was me, and we connected, and we and this has led to a lot of the great things that I've done through that networking connection, and then same thing with the meetups and meeting Vitalik and others in there. It just if you can. Form a community if it's not there, or you can join a community if there's one already there. You're gonna just the ideas flowing and the passion, and getting people together, and create some cool things. Well, listen, this was lovely, Anthony. So for everyone out there, number one, if you haven't done so and you and you need a wallet app or you want to see what Anthony's working on, uh, there are multiple versions, but he's recommended to look at Jax J A X X Liberty uh, in iOS and Android as well as you can look at it online. And for anyone interested in starting a uh, blockchain-based technology business, you can go to fi.co uh, slash join slash blockchain. All those links are in the chat. And uh, this was great, man. Thank you very much for your time. And, and we've, we, we had a hun many hundreds of people. So, uh, awesome. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question Maybe we can do this again and, and get to everyone's question next time. So this was Let's awesome. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for all the great questions. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take care and have a lovely, lovely morning, afternoon, and evening. Bye, everyone.